what does it mean to be alive? Now, I'm not asking you for the meaning of life. I'm asking you what it means to be alive. I'm alive. You're alive. At least I hope so since you're watching this video. Many of you can look around and define the things around you as being alive or not alive. But how do we do that in a biological context? How do we separate the living world from the non-living world? How do we separate living things like human beings and, and fungi and bacteria from the non-living things that we encounter like viruses? Well, that's what we're here to talk about today. The way we do that in biology is by looking for the seven properties of life. So this is a biology course, and in biology we're here to study the living world. So perhaps the first, maybe most important thing we can do is define what it is that we're looking for. What are the things that make the living world different from the non-living world? And those are the seven properties of life that biologists have settled upon that all living things have and help define them as being alive and separate them from the non-living portion of the universe. Now the first thing that we observe in all living things is order. Now, of course, we can see order in non-living entities as well as living entities, but only living entities require order to be present. Now, what do I mean by order? Order can take on lots of shapes and forms. For example, symmetry is one example of order. Human beings are bilaterally symmetrical. You could divide us right down the middle and end up with two mirror image halves. Now, that's not the case for all living things, but if you zoom in, Look even further, look below the macroscopic level and start looking at the cells that make up any living thing. Look at the trillions of cells that make up the body of a human being. Those cells aren't just randomly scattered. They're located in defined parts of the body. Those defined parts of the body are often called tissues. And those tissues are organized even farther into organs. And those organs are connected together into organ systems, all of which are essential to keep that human being alive. If you zoom in even further, if you look at the subcellular level, look inside any cell, and what you'll find is a highly ordered network of organelles and, and nucleic acids and proteins, all of which themselves are highly organized and ordered. This is not something that we observe in most non-living things. And the reason why is the universe actually trends towards disorder. Later on in the course, we'll have a conversation about the laws of thermodynamics, and one of the things we'll find out is that the universe trends towards chaos. The natural flow of things is to become more chaotic, less organized. So how do organ living organisms maintain order? And the answer is the second property of living things, energy processing. It takes energy to maintain high levels of order. Now on this planet, that energy is largely, in 99.9% .9 of all cases, supplied by the sun. And if you look at any food web, 99.9% .9 of them, you're going to find a producer at the bottom, an organism that is able to harness the power of photons of light from the sun and turn it into something useful, turn it into energy. And as you go up that food web, you will see things that eat those producers and then eventually mm. things that eat those things that eat the producers. Uh. That process of taking in energy and processing, a process that we define as metabolism, allows living things to break down what they consume, turn that into energy, and use those raw materials to form the things that they need to maintain order. So what do they do with all of that free energy that they generate? Well, one of the things they do is called homeostasis. The third property of life, homeostasis is the fact that what's going on inside of living things is always different than what's going on on the outside. For example, your internal body temperature is almost always, unless it's 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit outside, different from the outside world. That takes energy. That takes regulatory processes. The fourth property of life, regulation. Life is highly regulated, from the simplest single-celled organism to the most complex multicellular organism. There's a great amount of regulation that occurs that helps to tell the cells when to divide, when to grow. Helps them decide when food is no longer plentiful and they need to hunker down 
to starve. Those regulatory processes are the fourth property of all living things, but in large part are related to the fifth property, response to stimuli. All living things have the ability to respond to stimuli. They have the ability to sense the outside world, the changes in the outside world, and then alter their behavior in some way to respond to those conditions. Whether it's running away from a predator or moving towards food, whether it's a plant bending towards the sun or a cactus hoarding water because the outside conditions are so dry. All of these are things that are observed. These responses to stimuli are all things that living things are capable of doing. All living things have to have the ability to respond to the outside world, to respond to stimuli in order to survive. The sixth property of life is reproduction. All living things have to have the ability to reproduce to produce more of themselves. Otherwise, eventually you just run out of that thing. Human beings have to be able to reproduce more human beings and kitties have to be able to produce more kitties and bacteria have to be able to produce more bacteria. And finally, once you reproduce, you have to have growth and development, the seventh property of life. We start off as, as small babies and then we grow over a span of a few decades into fully mature adult human beings. The same thing happens in all living things. Sometimes the process is a little bit faster. So for example, bacteria are essentially born, grown and developed. In a matter of minutes, they go from being a new cell to being a fully functional adult bacterium, if it were. So those seven properties are found in all living things. And an inability to demonstrate even one of those properties usually renders you considered to be a non-living entity. So what's a great example of something that looks like it could be alive, but doesn't meet the characteristics and isn't considered to be alive? And the answer is viruses. So why are we talking about viruses at all? Well, for most part, as we're learning now, viruses have a huge impact on all living things. One of the reasons I'm talking to you today in this format instead of in person in class is because of the coronavirus. Yet those, that virus, which has proven deadly to hundreds of thousands of people throughout the world, that virus is not considered to be a living thing. Why? Well, it's not because they fail all the tests, but it's because it fails the majority of the tests for being a living thing. And the same can be said of all viruses, whether it's HIV or herpes or the, or the influenza virus. The one test they do pass is order. Viruses are highly ordered, are highly ordered. In fact, if you look at them under electron microscopy, some of them are quite gorgeous, very ornately organized, highly ordered structures. But they fail almost every test of being a living thing beyond that. They don't process energy at all. They contain no enzymes. They contain no ability to process any energy whatsoever. They don't maintain homeostasis. There really is nothing different inside of them from the outside world. Whatever temperature it is outside is the temperature that they are, for example. They have no regulatory processes. They don't respond to stimuli. Even if you fashioned a very, very tiny poking device and poked a virus, it would do nothing. They don't even reproduce on their own. In fact, viruses are really only functional when they're inside another living host cell. That's the only time they're able to reproduce. They can't reproduce more themselves. In fact, in order to reproduce, they have to hijack a host cell and they don't grow and develop. Even once they have reproduced inside of the host cell, they are assembled, not unlike a car is assembled on a manufacturing line. So viruses, although they are highly ordered, they do impact living things and they do exhibit at least one of the properties of being alive, fail the other six tests. Ooh. So in the end, what we talked about today, just to, rec just to recap, we went over the seven key properties of life. These are the seven things that you have that many other things in the universe don't. This is what makes you alive. It's what makes your kitty alive, and it's what makes bacteria alive, and fungi alive, and protists alive, but makes viruses considered to be non-living entities. So at least you got those seven things going for you. I'll see you next time.